Welcome back to Sensitivity Sessions. I'm Stephanie Gardner-Wright, and today we're talking about travel as a highly sensitive, easily overstimulated, and overwhelmed person. Today we'll be talking very practical tips. Typically on the podcast, we're talking more about delving into the past, healing, nervous system, all that good stuff. But today we're going to be focused on extremely practical tips that you can be aware of or use as you're traveling or perhaps planning to travel or maybe even dreaming of travel. There are some special considerations if you're highly sensitive or otherwise neurodivergent when you're traveling. A big thing that we want to keep in mind as sensitive people is uh, our tendency towards overstimulation and thinking about the difficulties of travel that it presents in terms of we know certain things like when we're supposed to be boarding the plane and when the plane is supposed to be arriving. But that is often changeable, especially lately with all of the issues at various airports, looking at you, Skipple, et cetera, have had recently. So we really have to be prepared that even our best laid plans may go south And what can we do to prepare for the unexpected in in whatever ways we best can to be comfortable to have the things that we need? So those really practical things are important for everyone, but especially when you have a sensitive nervous system, because you're going to be more affected by the transition times, the lack of transition. Even when you're traveling, there's this tendency to always be rushing and need to be somewhere at a certain place. And that can really be stressful for us. The first thing to be aware of is buffer time. We tend to plan and think, oh, this is going to take about this long. I think we tend to be very optimistic, time optimistic even, when we make travel plans. So we look at, okay, Google says it takes this amount of time to get from here to there. Well, maybe not calculating in some of the extra airport delays that we may have, things like that. So giving yourself extra buffer time whenever you can, just as a matter of course, just expect that things will take longer than you've planned for, especially if you're traveling with children, then double that buffer time and really minimize your activities as well if you have young children with you. But really being aware of how you can pad out your time and and buffer it so that you're not running from place to place feeling panicked and feeling overwhelmed more than is necessary, given how stressful travel is innately anyway. And definitely spend some time thinking about your physical comfort and sensory input and how you'll respond to that. There's so much sensory input, a lot of it unfamiliar when we're traveling. Even for the most seasoned travelers, there's a lot of jostling up against other people, potentially sharing of small spaces and very tight and close spaces typically that we have to ourselves when we're traveling. So thinking about how you can be comfortable, whether you're on a plane that's freezing cold and boilingly hot at turns or whether you're in a long car ride, perhaps with your family. I'm in Michigan. A lot of folks do the Michigan to Florida overnight drive, which is about 24 hours. Um, Hats off to you. I don't think I could do it, but a lot of folks do that with their families. So in that situation, you might want to think about how you could create a little, um, most like a sensory deprivation tank or a cozy area for yourself if you need to. So What I mean by that is if you need to be blocking out more ambient noise, if you know that that's really overstimulating for you, maybe look into those noise reducing earplugs. I know the loop ones are super popular. I've heard great things from folks that have used them. And you can also look into noise canceling headphones or even just regular headphones and having your device loaded up with some music or some podcasts or video that that you like to watch, either that you find comforting or maybe it's something new that you're looking forward to because of the novelty. So that's on auditory stimulation coming in and and somewhat visual as well. We can narrow our focus if there's something that we can focus on to where our field of vision doesn't feel quite as overwhelming, especially if there's a sense of panic or worry about flying. It's a good thing to think about that visual input and how can we be able to safely narrow our field of focus down, whether that's maybe something that you have to fidget with, which also works for getting out extra energy, Or maybe it's looking at your screen, if that feels soothing to you to have a video playing on there or a book that you bring. Could be anything, really. But thinking of that can be important, especially if you tend to get really overwhelmed. In terms of physical comfort, we also want to think about the types of clothing that we're wearing. So sensory issues, especially if you're sensitive to particular types of fabrics 
or tightness or looseness of clothing, just keep that in mind. This is probably not a time where you want to wear your tightest jeans and your scratchiest shirt. So definitely dress for comfort. Of course, if you're going on an airplane, or probably even in a car, dressing in layers is really good so that you can take off or put things on as you need. Also thinking in terms of, is there something that you can wear that's kind of blanket-like for the plane? That can be really nice if you have a really huge scarf that you can wear or um, a soft jacket of some kind that could double as a pillow or a blanket if you need. It's good to have that versatility. And on the note of sensory input, if you're a light sleeper or you don't sleep well in new places, maybe consider taking some earplugs and or a sound machine. There's a lot of free sound machine apps that are, are really great. You can even pick between types of white noise, brown noise, pink noise, all those different types of background noises now that can be really helpful, especially if you're in a busy city or you maybe are in a hotel with loud people on the floor above you, unfortunately. So thinking about ways to increase your comfort and ability to sleep once you get to wherever you're staying can be nice as well. This is more of a procedural thing, but it, in line with today's theme, very practical as well. So think about how you travel best, or if you are not sure, how you imagine you might travel best. Are you someone that would feel less overwhelmed, for instance, with carry-on only? Or maybe you feel like you're more in control of being able to have your stuff with you and, and not have it end up on the other side of the country while you're flying somewhere else, then maybe flying with just a carry-on feels better. Or maybe you're someone who feels very overwhelmed by the thought of having to schlep stuff through the airport and you want or need to be unencumbered for some reason. In that case, perhaps it makes more sense for you to check your baggage. And I know they're recommending those air tags now so that you can keep track of your luggage if it goes missing, but maybe not having to drag your suitcase around or um, need some assistance for that in the airport, perhaps that would be better for you. So just thinking about how you travel best, what is going to reduce your overall stress load as much as possible is important. And either way, make sure that you bring essentials in your personal items so that for some reason they make you check your carry-on bag that you'll have medications, glasses, or maybe a snack, a change of clothes, the essential things that you would need for a night or so if, for instance, you were separated from your luggage. My personal favorite way of, of traveling is carry-on only when I'm flying or I guess even if I'm going uh, on the road, it's just as simpler and I feel like I have less to keep track of that way. And this is really important for me because I just don't want to deal with the baggage claim if at all possible, it really stresses me out. And the thought of that makes me much more anxious than going through an airport carrying a carry-on. And I realize that this isn't the case for everyone, especially if you have mobility issues or have accessibility needs. And a carry-on just may not be possible for you. Uh, but for me personally, I'm able to do that. And even traveling in the winter, I've taken carry-on only. Just planning on taking laundry soap sheets that, that you can wash your clothes with and also getting those packing cubes that you can compress is really useful if you're traveling in the winter with some bulky stuff. If at all possible, traveling with folks that either have a similar traveling style or who will be responsive and respectful of different needs and preferences while traveling can be really important. So upfront communication with your traveling partners, even before you're booking your flights, ideally, would be a good way to think about this. But whenever you're able to communicate, just letting folks know if you might be staying back from some activities to take a nap at the hotel, for instance, or if you anticipate that you might be, or just giving people a heads up that being on the go all day long for 16 hours and seeing everything just isn't going to be something that you're up for. So thinking of how to manage that with traveling, companions can be important. If you're not someone who wants to be out partying to the early morning hours, perhaps you would choose not to go on a trip with people where you know or strongly suspect that you're going to be the only one who wants to have a slower pace and tuck in by 9 p.m., especially if that's um, going to be a problem with other people or they're not going to understand it, then maybe you actually choose not to book trips with people that are extremely different from how you would travel. If you just feel like you would be uncomfortable and or they would be uncomfortable and wouldn't understand. Not to say that people with different interests or traveling styles can't travel together well, but if it's so opposite, if they want to be parked on a beach all the time, but you want to be 
hiking and being active, it, it just may be frustrating for everyone involved unless there's some compromise that can happen. So being upfront about here's the type of trip that I want to have. Obviously, we're talking about more of a vacation here than a work trip, but the same applies in terms of your off hours, the types of things that you might like to do or even casually starting to talk about, hey, here's what I think that we might be able to do in our off time. Would you be down for this? Or how does this sound to you? Just opening those lines of communication can be really profitable. And then you're not as surprised when things don't go how you planned. And on that note, when we're highly sensitive, we often are picking up these subtle nonverbal cues that folks have. And so we are often interpreting a lot, reading between the lines or intuitively picking up what people are putting down. And that isn't the same for everyone that's less sensitive. So we may find ourselves feeling really frustrated or really irritated that people are not reading our minds in a way for them to be going at a certain pace and wanting to do things. And, and we may be thinking, don't they feel tired or don't they see that I'm getting tired? I'm stopping and, and sitting for a couple minutes. They're really in feeling jerks. It's easy for us to go down that path. When in reality, often people are just not aware and not noticing. Perhaps they're not noticing at the same level of detail that we might. So it's our responsibility to clearly communicate these things to people because they're not mind readers and they're typically not taking the time to notice what's happening with us, partially because they have their own stuff going on and partially it's not their responsibility. It's our responsibility to say, I'm getting tired. You guys have fun. I'll meet up with you in a couple hours, but I'm just going to go back to our place and just lay down for a little bit. Keep that in mind, too, of making your needs known and being upfront and, and not apologetic about it. It's OK for you to need to rest more. And that goes back to maybe picking travel companions that are going to be accepting of that or at least not give you a hard time. Cultivating flexibility is also really important when we're traveling as highly sensitive people. We may really have our hearts set on something or we may really have envisioned how something might go, especially because we have a tendency to be able to anticipate the fun things that are going to happen in the future and enjoy it as if we're already there and it's already happening as highly sensitive people. So it's part of the treat to be able to really imagine how something is going to be and getting this immense enjoyment from anticipating it. And that's wonderful. But the flip side of that can be that when the reality is not lining up remotely with our expectations, we can get very, very frustrated. So by all means, dream about what you want to do or have a plan, but try to cultivate some flexibility if things are just not working out. Be willing to have a plan B or be willing to just try to be spontaneous and see what might happen. It's not always going to be a 10 out of 10 experience. So a very personal example that springs to mind is I recently went with my family on a Christmas trip to parts of Western Europe. So we were on the border of France and Germany, and you hear all these stories about these little towns that just come alive at Christmas, these beautiful half-timbered houses, and there's all these glorious Christmas markets sprinkled all through these towns and how picturesque it is. So we went to one of these towns and, of course, we happened to pick a day where the railroads were striking because it, it's France. And also it was during a cold snap. It was unusually cold and nothing was going well. The trains were all delayed. We looked at this on paper before we left and we said, oh, great, it's only a 20 minute train ride from where we were staying to where we wanted to go. We'll just get on the train. It'll be so easy. We'll be there in 20 minutes, and then we'll just have our little day trip there and we'll come back. Ha, right, that was the plan. So the reality was we had a very grumpy, upset toddler who wasn't sleeping. The trains were often not running. A lot of them were canceled due to the strikes. So the train was delayed, and then we actually ended up having to be stuck on the tracks for an hour because there was a backup at another town. So what was supposed to be 20 minutes turned into more like an hour and a half to get to this storybook Christmas market town that we were supposed to be going to. So when we got there, okay, it's finally going to be great. We're going to have a wonderful time. We did not, in fact, have a wonderful time. There were wall-to-wall -wall crowds of people because it was a Sunday. And when I was planning, I didn't think, oh, a Sunday is probably going to be extra busy. It was freezing. All the restaurants were closed because they were full because it was so cold and everyone had the same idea, of course, to go in the restaurants. So we have a cranky toddler with a broken stroller, which is another story. 
We're outside. It's 15 degrees Fahrenheit and there's nowhere to go to warm up. So what was supposed to be our day trip, we decided to just throw in the towel and be flexible and chalk it up to experience. So we were there for maybe an hour. It was a pretty miserable hour. And then we just got on the train and, and headed back. So we just had to be flexible at that point and try to find what humor we could and go back and rest at our place and <laughs> do whatever we could to feel OK in that moment. Very much an instance of something that on paper looked like we'd have enough time and looked like it was going to be simple, did not, in fact, turn out to be that way. And we could have tried to muscle through and tried to make it work. But honestly, it would just would have been more miserable than just saying, you know what, this is a fail of a day and we're just going to try again tomorrow. So to that point, emotions can run high during trips, even with people that you travel well with. Typically, you're not the most well-rested. You may not be eating or drinking nourishing stuff, and so you may not physically feel well, and tempers can run high. So having a way to offload or process all of this can be really important, not only intense emotions or frustrations while traveling, but also your experiences in general, because as highly sensitive people, we are processing at such a deep level and also processing really thoroughly. So have a way in mind that you can process, whether it's doing a voice note to yourself on your phone or maybe you write in a paper journal or even in the notes app on your phone, just some way where you're able to make sense of and process and record the events of your day. It can be a really nice little ritual for us as highly sensitive people in unfamiliar places. So Having a way to do that can really offload some of the tension that you might be feeling as well day to day. So let's talk about crowds and potential overstimulation there. Now, not everyone is affected by this. Some people are unbothered by crowds, but if you're highly sensitive, you probably are overstimulated by significant amounts of crowds. So if you're going somewhere that tends to be a busy area, think about visiting attractions in an off hour, either really early in the morning, right when they open, or maybe right before they're about to close, like an hour before. That can often help avoid some of the worst crowds. If you're taking public transportation, then that can be another situation as well that's really crowded. If you can, if it makes sense, maybe trying to avoid the really rush hour commute times could be helpful too. And a visualization that you can do for this, if you feel very overstimulated by crowds and there's really no way out of the crowd except through at that point, what you can do is imagine either a white bubble of light or really any color that you want, but a bubble of light around you that is completely around your body and, and protective in some way. Or you can imagine a force field where everyone can't come through that and, and they're bouncing off of that force field. That can be a helpful visualization to feel like you're creating a little more space for yourself. In terms of creating physical space, you could think about wearing a backpack so people maybe don't or can't get quite as close to you. However, the flip side of that is that you may get knocked more on the backpack or, or you may forget that you're taking up more physical space and you may run into stuff more. So your mileage may vary with that, but I know some folks find it comforting to have a backpack on to pad out their physical space when they're in a crowd. And make sure that you have plenty of snacks and water with you. You probably don't want to be loaded down like a pack mule necessarily, but having something on your person, especially if you're out for the day or you don't really know when you'll be back where you're staying, is a good idea. Because as highly sensitive people, we're more affected than most folks by hunger and thirst and, and other physical functions. If you need to go to the bathroom frequently, there's also apps where you can look where the public bathrooms are in any given place where you are. So that may be something you need to have handy as well because it can be really physically uncomfortable to be out and about and either have to go use the bathroom or be thirsty or hungry and not really be able to do anything about that. So being able to prepare a little bit can pay off a lot. Have some quick snack with you or even a small bottle of water because it's easy to think that you might get to a restaurant by a certain point or back to your place or the grocery store to get supplies, but it often doesn't work out that way. So make sure that you can be physically comfortable and nourished regardless of what the plan is. And this is maybe one of the most important tips, in my opinion, is leave room for the small joys and a sense of wonder. 
It's so easy when we're traveling, even if it's traveling for fun on vacation, it's so easy to just get in the mode of we've got to get to the next thing or we've got to check the next thing off of our list. And we can often forget to slow down and just take in the beauty that's wherever we're at. So try to mindfully slow down and enjoy something about each day where you're at. And this too is where thinking about your values can come in handy. Why are you traveling? Is there a deeper reason behind your travel? So are you traveling in order to have uh, more experiences of the world? Or is it another reason that feels really important to you why you might be traveling? Even if it's a reason why you have to go, like it's a business trip, maybe there's something important in that that feels like it could sustain you. Maybe it's important for you to make connections with colleagues or to network while you're on a business trip, for example. So focusing on whatever that value is, what's important to you can really help to put those things into perspective. You can remind yourself, what is the reason I'm actually traveling for? Is it, if it's to have experiences, then are you doing that? So having that perspective shift, because sometimes we can get so focused on the details I want to visit every single beach up and down this coastline and I'm not going to be satisfied until I do. I have to see all of these lighthouses, whatever it is that you might be wanting to do on your trip and accomplish. We can really lose sight of maybe the deeper meaning behind things. Reminding yourself of that can feel really helpful and remind you of the smaller joys in, in the present moment. Maybe the sense even of aliveness while you're traveling. And even if you aren't traveling for pleasure necessarily, so if you're having to travel for business or for another reason, try to carve out some time for yourself, even if it's just one evening that you have out either sightseeing and kind of taking in the local culture and, and the local feel of wherever you're at, or maybe you book a restaurant that's typical cuisine for the area, just something where you have some time for yourself to experience things on your own where it's not a have-to situation like when you're at a business conference. Most of us have to be there. So finding moments that feel like they're just yours and maybe sharing them with people that you want to. And don't forget to connect with local people. Try to learn a few words of the language or languages to where you're going ahead of time um, to be polite. A little of that goes a long way and People really appreciate your attempt to show respect for their culture by learning polite things like hello, goodbye, thank you, where, where can I find this? Just basic things like that communicate some respect and some effort. And connecting with other people on, on travel is maybe one of the most important parts of travel to find that our commonalities are greater than our differences and getting to connect with people in different parts of the world and realizing that we're not so different after all. That human-to-human -human connection can really be one of the most rewarding parts of travel. Even though we all have different cultures and different backgrounds, that most of us want the same things in life. We want our kids and family to be healthy. We want to build good memories with our families or chosen families, and we want to have a good life. So even if you're introverted, try to challenge yourself or push yourself gently just a little bit to have some interactions with People that are local to the area where you're going, again, trying to be respectful of their cultural differences. And this is a callback to a few minutes ago when we talked about processing time. But another thing to consider is reflection time. When you're home from your trip or maybe you're even on the airplane flying home or is in passenger seat driving home, thinking about how has what you've experienced changed you? How have you grown from your experience? And how did you either tap into another side of yourself or increase your comfort zone? And is there anything that you can let go when you go back to your typical daily life? Or can you take a new understanding of yourself back to your regular life? Travel can really be a window into other parts of ourselves as well as other cultures and uh, other areas of the world where people can live very differently than we ourselves do. And it can really get us in touch with parts of us that maybe we haven't in a long time or we haven't thought were possible before. So bringing a sense of that back home with you, again, even if you were on a business trip and it feels like that might be minimal, but was there something that you did that you were proud of or maybe something unexpected that you took a lesson from? These are ways we can make meaning out of travel and find new aspects of ourselves and relate to ourselves in a different way. So this reflection time is also part of 
processing the experience and making meaning, which is so important for us as highly sensitive people. I hope you enjoyed listening to some of the travel tips today. I really enjoyed getting to talk to you about travel. It's uh, one of my favorite subjects, and some of the lessons have been pretty hard won, so I hope that they could be helpful. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. That really helps me get out the information on this podcast to a wider group of highly sensitive people. And I will look forward to talking with you next time on the next episode of Sensitivity Sessions. Bye for now.